Well, we are launching in today uh, to week one of a series called That's My King. It's gonna be an eight-week series on the book of Revelation. Someone say, dun, 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 all right? Anytime you jump into a study on this book, it, it comes with a couple different responses. There will be some who are enthusiastic and eager, individuals who are familiar with the text and can't wait for others to grasp a hold of its meaning. And I would say, uh, continue to bring your enthusiasm and eagerness to the conversation. It, it will be needed. Uh, there will be others who, the moment they hear us jumping into a conversation like this, uh, it almost comes with some triggers that starts to produce fear and anxiety, worry, uh, because maybe uh, how you were taught the book of Revelation and the things that you were explained regarding the end times and God's plan for it all uh, were taught in a way that endorsed fear uh, rather than produced faith. And I don't know about you, uh, but I grew up on the Left Behind series and I was convinced in every conversation I was gonna be left behind. And the book of Revelation deals uh, heavily with what we would refer to as eschatology, big theological term. But eschatology is ultimately the study and theology regarding death, judgment, the last days, rapture, all the things that are included in that conversation. And this conversation comes with a mixed variety of opinions, traditions, experiences, and explanations. And I'll say on the front end, there's a few things that I think would be appropriate and healthy uh, for us as a church to agree to. And in fact, the first one, I'm going to have you repeat to your neighbor. And that is, we are not going to fight. Look at your neighbor and say, we are not going to fight. When you show up to your life group this week and you jump into the discussion, just remind yourself, hey, uh, we're, we're not gonna fight. Uh, again, this conversation is loaded and it comes with a lot of opinions. In fact, uh, as social media has taken shape and given platforms to anybody and everybody, we find that those opinions are becoming more and more diverse. And if you were to just look at my email box, uh, you would find that our church represents a span and spectrum of people who have different views on this. And I think it would be dishonoring to God and unproductive for us as a church family uh, to resort to unnecessary arguing and debate over open-handed issues that we should lean into with humility. And I would say in addition to this uh, not fighting idea, I would say we're not gonna lose our fire. What can happen, and I'm certainly guilty of this, is we can lean heavy into theory and we can lean heavy into the academic side of thing, looking for uh, information and explanations. But what can happen is, is our obsession with information can cause us to neglect our transformation. And it's really important that anytime we open up the pages of scripture, uh, that God's word drops 16 inches from our head to our heart and continues to transform our lives, ultimately producing God's work in us and through us. And I think it would be a huge miss and misinterpretation of this book uh, if we were to lose our fire. If anything, this ought to invoke passion boldness, zeal, and an unyielding desire to pursue Christ despite what we face and despite the circumstances of our world. He is God. He is in full control. He is the sovereign one who knows all things and is the source of all logic and reasoning. And he has your best interest in mind. And for those of us who are in Christ, the book of Revelation is great news that should come with great delight. In fact, I would say if you read the book of Revelation and it doesn't fill you with hope and put a smirk on your face, chances are you're not reading it right. Uh, that this is a wonderful, perplexing, moving text uh, that resorts or ends uh, in this ultimate conclusion that in the end, God is triumphant. In the end, his integrity is impeccable and what he says will come to pass will come to pass and you and I end up on the right side of history. Can I get an amen? We, we celebrate that. We're not gonna lose our fire. In addition to that, we're not gonna become fanatics. Uh, I think anytime you jump into the book of Revelation, there will always be a tendency uh, to start getting out our calendars and getting out our charts and start listening to all the individuals uh, who have made bold and precise predictions as to timing and place as to when God will arrive. And, and I would just say, the one thing that all of those people have in common 
is they were all wrong. Throughout the history, individuals, I think with pure intentions uh, and good motives, have sought to interpret and discern uh, the revelation. And they have made their best attempt to say, I think it could point uh, to this. Individuals who have had a profound influence on my personal theology, who I still hold in high regards as heroes of the faith. Individuals like a Billy Graham, who came out with a bold, uh, uh, you know, passionate prediction, and then later would have to uh, recant that statement. And I would just say, again, we could learn a great deal of wisdom from those who came before us in approaching this conversation humbly. I have a buddy who did a series on the book of Revelation, and I love what he told his church. He said, hey, the moment we go off the rails and the moment we get weird, we're gonna stop the series and jump into the book of Lamentations. And uh, I thought, hey, that, that's pretty good. Uh, however, I, I do feel extremely confident in, in just where we are at as a church and as a faith community, that this is a conversation uh, that we can have that will be beneficial as well as just a joy to journey through uh, together. And iron sharpens iron uh, when we stay with the dialogue. I think a mark of spiritual maturity is an individual who can sit in the tension and embrace other perspectives as we journey together. Every single one of us across all of our locations comes from different experiences, different traditions, different theological trainings. And I think it would be a miss to not harness the collective brilliance of our church and move together as a unit. But just know there will be elements to this series uh, that will leave mysterious things mysterious. Uh, there will be, without a doubt, individuals who will be disappointed in me and disappointed in, in this series. One, there will be some who are disappointed because I don't say the one thing they're hoping I'm going to say, the one prediction, uh, make the one claim or bold statement. And there's going to be others who want me to spend more time on certain ideas or topics. And, and I would just say, if you could extend grace to me on the front end, I, I do think we can uh, make this a fruitful conversation for all of us. Uh, it is going to come with some mystery though. Uh, when it comes to things like the arrival of Christ and the second coming, uh, I do think we need to throw caution to the wind for anyone who really rises up in uh, certainty and confidence as to when they know uh, the arrival of Christ. Matthew chapter 24, verse 36, Christ himself said, no one knows the day or hour in which the son will return. And if you do a deep dive into the Greek and Hebrew and translate that accurately, what that means is no one knows uh, the day and time. So again, let's just take a deep breath. Uh, we're not gonna become fanatics. In addition to that, we're not gonna succumb to fear. If you read the book of Revelation and it produces fear, you read it wrong. If anything, it ought to put some steel within your spine that gives you um, a greater courage and a stature to stand firmly within the world that we live in, in a way that honors God and continues to align us with his promises and purposes uh, for our lives. Uh, but I would say the one thing we are gonna do is we're gonna remain faithful. That would certainly be one of the agendas of this text is to produce a faithfulness within the community of believers to say, hey, come what may, despite being surrounded by pain and surrounded by noise and chaos and surrounded by wickedness and evil, I am going to remain faithful uh, to a God who is always faithful to me. And I think it is our faithfulness that positions us to experience God's faithfulness. The breakdown is never on his end, uh, but as we remain faithful, we discover more and more the goodness and the steadfast patience and faithfulness uh, of our God, amen? In addition to that, on the front end, uh, this will be a little academic in terms of an introduction, but when it comes to eschatology, when it comes to the reading of, of the book of Revelation, there are four primary camps. And I would say all of them are represented within our church because I've had conversations with individuals who are in these camps. Like most categories and camps of people nowadays, uh, we often identify or view or label a camp by their extremist. You ever been annoyed by that? Ever frustrated by, oh, like these kind of people are all this way. And that is definitely the case in this conversation. But the four camps, first would be preterism. Preterism is the view that 
all things that are foretold, prophesied, promised, and predicted in scripture have already come to pass. They are behind us. Now, the extreme view of that is everything is behind us. A more balanced conservative view is certainly there are some things that were prophesied about that are behind us. Uh, and so we can recognize that, yes, this is being fulfilled and has uh, been fulfilled in some ways. The other group would be known as uh, historicism. Historicism is the group that seeks to align all of the text with events, people, places, and circumstances throughout history. And, and I think there's a lot of merit to this group. You can read the text and then you can read the times and you can find yourself with this impulse or intuition to think, are these two addressing the same situation? You wanna find yourself looking at the world around us, looking at what is happening in the Middle East and the war with Israel and Iran and Palestine and think to yourself, this kind of has echoes of things talked about in scripture. You look at things with Russia and Ukraine and the different uh, turbulence and turmoil happening around the world. And you can't help but think, I get the sense scripture was talking about this. I read a study recently that uh, said over the last 12 months, get this, over the last 12 months, there have been 60, 60 national elections around the world. It's amazing. There is a massive changing of the guard. And when you do an extensive look into the people and the policies making their way into power, uh, you can't help but uh, sense some hair stand up on the back of your neck and think, is this the time that scripture was pointing to? So there is this historicism camp. And again, I think there's, there's merit to that. I would also say there is what is called the idealism camp. Idealism will look at scripture and say, it's all symbolism. It's all allegory, metaphor, and imagery. And it is not uh, supposed to be interpreted any longer as prophecy, prediction, or promises, but it is to be interpreted as principles. And once more, uh, that would be the extreme view of this camp, that everything is imagery and metaphor. Nothing is to be taken literally. And I would say that is where they, they come into air. Certainly there is a lot of imagery throughout the book of Revelation that invokes and even jars our soul to some degree, uh, but not all of it uh, in scripture is meant to just be a metaphor that you and I can manipulate and be creative with. There are some things that Jesus said with clarity in scripture as well uh, that will come to pass in our literal statements. Uh, the last group would be what is called futurism. Now, again, the extreme view of this camp would be futurism believes that all the prophecies and all the promises and everything that was foretold is still in front of us in the future. And I would say uh, that is a bit of an extreme view. The more conservative view within that camp would say uh, prophecy, scripture, a lot of this tells us what has happened, what is happening, and what will happen. And in case you're curious, our church leadership, we lean towards a futurism view in that camp that we believe scripture tells us what has happened, what is happening, and what will happen. However, I grew up in Colorado and in the south, southern part of our state, we have what was called the Four Corners. The Four Corners is where the, the four surrounding states came together uh, so perfectly uh, that the borders aligned and you could visit and actually be in four states at once. You would spread out in the bit of a, a push-up form, put one hand in one state, the other in another state, and then do the same with your legs, and you could be in four states at once. And I am a, a bit of a nonconformist, and I think you do away with uh, three of the four camps and you lose a bit of the truth. I, I think there is merit and benefit to recognizing the efforts and the reasoning uh, behind each of these groups. Uh, I would also say, despite whatever group you are in, uh, whether you even realize you're a part of a group, <laughs> uh, you can be a part of our church. I think it is nonsense and re ridiculous for individuals to think, the moment I find a disagreement with a community of people, I now have to alienate myself from the fellowship. Folks, 
uh, that is going to just create a ton of havoc in your life and is a very unproductive and unhealthy approach to relationship. We can lean in together, amen? And what I love about scripture is uh, it's a library, 66 books, uh, and it's all telling the same story. We just came out of a two-week series about the Bible that landed that. But a couple statistics that I think you should write down or keep in mind when reading the book of Revelation is one, there is 404 verses in the book of Revelation. Now, in addition to that, there are 518 references to scripture in the book of Revelation. That's amazing. Basically, every sentence is drenched and clothed in God's word. What I love about John and what I think is so mesmerizing and brilliant about his writings is though there are 518 references to scripture, there's not a single direct quote. The the writing and the skill that that requires is, is quite impressive. And so for the individuals who are eager to jump into Revelation, I love that. For the individuals who are new to the faith who think, give me that Bible, I'm gonna crack the code. Just know this. Uh, you will not be able to interpret the last book of the Bible or even understand the last book of the Bible if you don't have a solid grasp on the first 65 books of the Bible. This is all one cohesive narrative and thought. There is one camp of people uh, that uh, recently someone shared this video of a guy who was explaining a theory that says God got to the end of Scripture and realized his plan wasn't working. And so he decided to try a new strategy and to take a different approach. Thus came the book of Revelation. And I would just say this as gently and politely as I possibly can. That in my mind is heresy. Uh, Our God does not change his mind. And what you find in the book of Revelation is not a new strategy and certainly not new truth. What you find in Revelation is truth in a new view and a new perspective that enlarges and enhances our vision. Whoa, that's my king. And so if you have your Bibles, open up to Revelation chapter one. And verse one, it says this, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, two statements there that we need to emphasize. One, it's the revelation, not revelations. Anyone live with someone who puts an S at the end of every statement? Anyone courageous enough to admit that that person's you? Just know, I actually might do that today. I might just put an S at the end of it, but there is only one revelation. And this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now that word of can mean one of two things. It can either mean from or it can mean about. Okay, is this the revelation from Jesus Christ or is this the revelation about Jesus Christ? And the answer is yes, it's both. That is what is making it uh, so valuable that this is his doing and it is a gift to all of us. He goes on to say, which God gave him to show his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angels to his servant, John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it for the time is near. Some theologians will refer to this as the Beatitudes of the Revelation. If you think of the Sermon on the Mount, it starts with the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed, blessed, blessed. And in many ways, a revelation begins in a similar fashion. Blessed are those who read aloud this text. Blessed are those who hear it. And blessed are those who, who keep it. And the good news is just by showing up, uh, you have received two of the three blessings, right? That we are gonna read this aloud and we're all gonna listen to what God has to say. The question is, is will we keep it? And the word keep there is not to imply keep it safe. It's not to instruct us to do what the passive and overly cautious servant in the parable of the talents did, who took what he was entrusted with and went and hid it and didn't make it useful. No, it's not to say keep it safe. It's to say keep it up, keep at it, 
Keep it going forward. Keep with it. And there is a bit of a sequence, maybe this is something to write down, that as you go through the revelation, the sequence would be listen, obey, conquer, and know. Listen, obey, conquer, know. You could almost make an acronym out of the word lock. That as we listen and we obey, obedience is always on the front end of evidence. And ultimately, we do find our lives statured and positioned to triumph over the things that we're facing and to discover that God's promises are true, that we are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. And you discover that come what may, greater is he that's within you than he that's within the world. Uh, You do conquer some things. Wave at me if there's some things in your life that you need to conquer, some challenges coming your way. Yeah, at all of our campuses, there are things and challenges uh, that we ought to not retreat, but we ought to rise up in faith saying, God uh, has positioned me and equip me for the challenges coming my way. And as we do so, uh, we arrive at a place of greater confidence. We arrive at a place of greater certainty. I know that I know that my God is trustworthy. I know that I know he is faithful and I can take him at his word and he has impeccable integrity. And, and that's, that's wonderful. Now, to jump into this, you, you have to understand that John is Uh, writing a piece of literature that if you don't understand the type of literature you're reading, uh, you can misread the text. And what Revelation is, is it's three things. First, it is an apocalypse. Now, the moment you and I hear the word apocalypse, we have been primed to think natural disasters and things that are apocalyptic in terms of extreme circumstances. But that's not what the original word apocalypse means. The original word apocalypse means a a breaking through, an unveiling or a revealing. So ultimately, right off the bat, this book is a breaking through from Christ about Christ. It is a unveiling and a revealing from Christ about Christ, and it is meant to open our eyes to a reality that there is more than what just meets our five senses. Folks, yes, there is a lot that we can see and uh, experience, but if you don't understand that much of what we face and experience in life is clothed in the spiritual, uh, you will miss a lot of what is taking place. There is more than what meets the eye. This is apocalyptic. In addition to that, it is prophecy. The book of Revelation is prophecy. And the moment that word comes out of my mouth, it creates two groups of people. One, there will be those who are enthusiastic and excited. The moment they hear prophecy, they get ramped up uh, because they uh, just wanna turn the church into a circus as if God cares nothing about order and has not instructed us as to how to lean into this. Uh, And then there will be the group of people who are so turned off by some of the manipulation and people who have plagiarized words from God uh, and said, hey, God said, and so be it, uh, that they resist anything that is prophetic. And I would say as your pastor, I have concern for both camps. I would say for the group that uh, assumes uh, God lacks order and that church should be a circus, uh, that's not a proper understanding of the prophetic. I would say for the person who resists the prophetic, you ought to know that 26%, I did the math, of your Bible is prophecy. So much of what is shaping, guiding, and informing your spiritual formation is the prophetic. And you have to understand that that is part of this literature. And then lastly, this is a letter. This is a letter being written by a real person to real people in real places facing real problems. And that is important to understand. John is is writing a letter and he picks up in verse four and it says, John to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, dead, and the ruler 
of the kings of earth. I'm gonna say that again. The ruler of the kings of earth, whoever your favorite candidate is, just know they're accountable to somebody. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priest to his God and father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever, amen. Behold, he is coming. And I'm gonna say it again. Behold, he is coming. And I have a great deal of concern. There is a, a bit of a movement of young, cute theologians who are trying to dismiss and do away with the second coming of Christ. And folks, if you wanna succumb to despair and depression and hopelessness, do away with the second coming of Christ and subscribe to a God that abandons his children and leaves us all hopeless orphans. He is coming again. The first time he showed up to punish sin, the next time he shows up to rescue and redeem the saints for all of eternity, he is coming again. And, and as a church, uh, it, it's important for us to know uh, that is a hard line belief that we're not gonna waver on. Jesus Christ is going to return. And that is a wonderful, wonderful promise. He is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him, even so, amen. For I am the alpha and the omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Come on, someone say, that's my king. He is the Alpha and the Omega. Now, again, you not only have to understand, like, what's the literature I'm reading? You have to understand the person who is writing. You have to understand the context and the aim of their writings. John is experiencing hell on earth. In fact, the final 30 years of John's life are terrible. None of us in this room across all of our locations, and this is not to diminish anyone's personal pain, it's not to do that, but we have not experienced or witnessed the things that John experienced and witnessed. John is now writing in his 80s, and around 60 AD, things for the Christian community just really went south. A guy by the name of Nero had a disgusting disdain for the community of faith and found it to be sport when it came to murdering Christians. In fact, what he would do is he would gather large groups of people and as entertainment, he would feed Christians to lions. And that was only the beginning. Following Nero would come other Caesars who would just follow trait uh, with what he was doing. There came one point where they actually murdered 40,000 Christians at one time. Mass massacre. Around this time, Peter was murdered, Paul was murdered, Timothy was murdered, and the temple completely destroyed. I mean, we all bump into situations where we think to ourselves, it could not be worse. But when you look at John's life, folks, it could be worse. And this man's resolute confidence, faith, and devotion to Christ is mesmerizing and it's inspiring. This is why I say you cannot read the book of Revelation and not find that it puts some steel within your spine. It causes us to rise up and recognize the heritage of faith and the heroes that came before us and the paths that were blazed so you and I could walk this journey with Christ. We all ought to salute John as a remarkable general within the faith. What he's going through is tremendous. He gets to the end of his life and there's a Caesar by the name of Domitian who was an extreme narcissist who thought he was a god. And he implemented this petty practice where everyone in the community would have to come into the courts and they would have to sprinkle incense and they would have to make the statement, Caesar is Lord. And I love John because he's a renegade. He is a rebellion against the rebellion. And he looks at this, you know, moron and joke of a leader and thinks to himself, there's no way I am going to honor you as Lord when I know who the Lord actually is. I did life with him. 
I literally lived and dined with him. I heard him teach. I seen him do miracles. I watched him die. And then I seen him come back to life. I was so close with the Lord that standing at the foot of the cross, for whatever reason, John would say, he entrusted me to look after his own mother. I know the Lord. There's no way I'm going to call this bonehead Lord. And I would just be careful anytime you're tempted to start viewing anyone else as Lord besides Christ and Christ alone. Anytime you offend a narcissist, they don't take it well. And Domitian uh, decides to try to take John out. They actually decide that they are going to burn him to death. So they set him ablaze, and what happens? He doesn't die. So now they're thinking, well, this is a problem. He's now lived through this situation. If we kill him, it creates a martyr, then creates an uprising. Uh, what we should now just do is exile him to prison on the island of Patmos. The island of Patmos was 10 miles off the shore. It was a rock quarry and it was a prison. The best way for you and I to maybe envision it in our minds is to think Alcatraz. And this is where he is left to die. And it is here that he writes the longest letter and the most provocative, inspirational, and just insightful vision of Christ and the end times uh, available to man. It's amazing what this man does in absolute hell. And it is his words that carry such tremendous weight. You have to understand John. You have to understand his context. You have to understand who he is. You have to understand the aim of his writings. First, you have to receive him as St. John, the theologian. John was a brilliant man. John would write his own book. And what was that called? John. Now, you didn't even see that coming. It's like, whoa. <laughs> and he starts out in John chapter one. And he says, in the beginning was the word, logos. In the beginning was the source of all logic and all reasoning, the brilliant creator himself. And he was with God and he was God and all things were created through him. And he made his dwelling among us because something about this God wants to have a personal relationship with you and I. And he was full of grace and truth. Grace without truth is spineless. Truth without grace is heartless. He did not forfeit one or the other. He was full of grace and truth. And John tells us some remarkable things about God. He's a theologian. And Eugene Peterson, who is one of my favorite authors, who is also responsible for the message translation of the Bible, which is a wonderful paraphrase of scripture. If you're new to the Bible, uh, it makes it accessible and understandable. And it's also great if you're listening to it on audio. Eugene Peterson said this about John. He says, St. John is a theologian of a particularly attractive type. All his thinking about God took place under fire. I was on the aisle called Patmos, a prison aisle. He was a man thinking on his feet, running or on his knees, praying postures characteristic of our best theologians. There have been times in history when theologians were supposed to inhabit ivory towers and devote themselves to writing impenetrable and ponderous books. But the important theologians have done their thinking and writing about God in the middle of the world in the thick of action. And Eugene Peterson would go on to explain how many of the great theologians had this in common. The apostle Paul would write his letters from prison. St. Augustine, Thomas Aquinas, Luther, Calvin, individuals who wrote about God, articulated theology in the thick of action and the hardship of this life. And I love how Eugene Peterson sums it up. He says this, the task of these theologians is to demonstrate a gospel order in the chaos of evil. The, the goal of these theologians is to demonstrate a gospel order in the chaos and evilness of our world is what he's saying. And arrange the elements of experience and reason so that they are perceived proportionately and coherently. Sin, 
defeat, discouragement, prayer, suffering, persecution, praise, and politics are placed in relation to the realities of God and Christ. Holiness and healing, heaven and hell, victory and judgment, beginning and ending, their achievement, this is my favorite statement, is that the community of persons who live by faith in Christ continue to live with a reasonable hope and in intelligent love. And, and I would just say, no, that would be one of my goals throughout this entire series. Lord, would you graft within us and help us maintain a reasonable hope and an intelligent love because my goodness, the world needs it. He is a theologian and our world will always be in need of theologians who get us to think critically about God. Not just tell us what to think, but give us the handles as to how to think. He's a theologian. You also have to understand that he is St. John the poet. In fact, most don't know this and it causes them to misread or misinterpret the text, but Revelation is poetry. It's a poem and it is marked with so much vivid imagery and artistry and if you do not read it as poetry, uh, I do not think you can fully grasp or understand where John is leading us in his thought. And, and I love what, you know, is, is said about poetry. Um, I, I lost my quote there, but W.H. Auden said this. He said, we demand of a poem two things. Firstly, it must be a well-made verbal object that does honor to the language in which it is written. There's no question uh, this piece of work in that context, uh, facing those circumstances, uh, is such a, a, a brilliant use of the language he had access to. Secondly, it must say something significant about a reality common to us all, but perceived from a unique perspective. It must say something significant about a reality common to us all, but perceived differently. And, and doesn't Revelation do that? It's like, yeah, we all know that Jesus is king, but you open Revelation and say, whoa, but that's a different perspective on his kingship. Yeah, we all know that in the end we win, but whoa, does this victory come with some fireworks? There are things that we are, believe and are common to us, but John's vision, it, it just gives us a mesmerizing perspective. But my favorite thing about John the thing that I think you have to understand is he is St. John, the pastor. He's St. John, the pastor. This is where I think some in the futurism camp uh, really miss it because John is writing a letter again to real people facing real problems in real places. If everything John was writing had nothing to do with the people experiencing hell, but only us 2000 years later, what a tone deaf letter and how inconsiderate that was. No, this is someone who cares deeply about these congregations and the people he's been leading. And there's that statement at the end of the passage that says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Part of our theology is we believe that the beginning was good and we are convinced that the ending is good. So we often assume that the middle would be good as well. Yeah, what we discover is humanity fractured God's beautiful, wonderful plan. And so though we live anchored to two good points, one in the beginning and one at the end, we live in oftentimes a confusing, heartbreaking, perplexing, painful, wicked, evil, broken middle. And the pastor is the one who comes alongside people in the broken middle and empathizes with their pain, yet doggedly insists that, hey, he's still good. He's still faithful. You can still trust him. And in the end, he works all things together for the good of those who trust him. That is John, John the pastor. You have to receive him as pastor. And I think a, a good question well, or maybe it's something to consider, is whenever you're writing something, 
whenever you're even explaining something, whether you realize it or not, subconsciously, there is a question in the back of your mind that you're answering. In some ways, you're responding to a question in the back of your mind. And maybe something for you to think about when we gather is, as I'm speaking, what question is he responding to? And maybe the question in a text like this is, what is the primary question? In a moment like this as your pastor, what is my primary question? Now, I think for a lot of people, when they jump into the text on Revelation, the question they wanna ask is, what does this mean? But you should just know, that's not the question I'm asking. And I don't believe it was the question John was fully asking. The question I'm asking, the question of a pastor, is how does this work in the church? How does this work in the lives of those in the broken middle? How does this work for individuals who are just trying their best to honor God and live in the perplexities of our life? How does it work? And when you understand that that's the aim, I think as a church, we could, we could benefit greatly. John is a pastor. And he closes by saying this, I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamum, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice, which we don't have time for this, but I think that would be a fun conversation. How do you see something you should hear? That was speaking to me, and on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man clothed with a long robe indicating his priesthood, with a golden sash around his chest indicating his kingship, the hair of his head were white like wool, white like snow, indicating his purity, his timelessness, and his wisdom. His eyes were like a flame of fire, indicating his sovereignty and his omniscient ability to know all things, see all things, and hold everything accountable to his righteousness. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace, because all the strongest metals have to go through a refiner's fire. And John is saying, when I looked at our king, I seen him resolute, I seen him immovable, I seen him unshakable, and nothing is getting him bumped off his footing. Our God stands firmly able to accomplish what he promises to do. Refined by fire and his voice, like the roar of many waters, if you've ever stood next to a river, uh, you recognize that there's a bit of a surround sound to it, that God's word and voice is, is all encompassing. In his right hand, he held the seven stars from his mouth, came a sharp two-edged sword, which we just came out of a series, double-edged sword. And his face was like the sun shining in full strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead, but he laid his right hand on me saying, fear not. I am the first and the last and the living one. I died and behold, I am alive forevermore. I have the keys of death and Hades, which is a stack hands, like oorah kind of moment. Write, therefore, the things you have seen, those that are and those that are to take place after this. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw on my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. It's amazing. Jesus is breaking through and he is sending a message to you know, really assist the churches of the day. And what he doesn't do is send in a task force. What he doesn't do is send in a new strategy. What he doesn't do is suggest new methods. What does he do? He just gives them a vision of who he truly is. Over the last couple of years, I've had the terrible experience of riding in the back of an ambulance with two of my children. 
I had one child who fell over a second story balcony uh, who ended up in the ICU. It was terrible. And I had another child who had a grandma seizure uh, who also was rushed to the ICU in the uh, back of an ambulance. And in those moments, uh, I felt completely paralyzed as a father. Maybe you can relate to this. What do I do? And quite honestly, I just copied the things that I see my dad do on my behalf when I was in pain. Paramedics are all around. They're hooking your child up. They're doing all kinds of things. And all I could think to do was to tell my children, hey, look at me. Don't worry about what they're doing. Hey, just would you look at me? Focus on dad. Would you just keep your eyes on me? And in many ways, Christ is coming to people who are going through absolute turmoil, people who are perplexed and confused about the world. And he's saying, hey, hey, I know there's a ton of noise. I know there's a ton of wickedness and pain. I know people are doing wild things. But up here, would you look at me? Would you keep your eyes on me, the King of Kings, the sovereign Lord of it all? And he says, the church is the lampstand. Exodus 25, you gotta go there this week. It lays out the tabernacle, tells us its dimensions. It tells us its material. It, it tells us of its furnishing and where everything was placed. In the holies of holies, the lampstand was the only source of light. And it was positioned strategically right in front of the table of showbreads. The priest would have a table there with bread and the table of showbreads, symbolically to give you a, some cliff notes, was there to represent four things. God's power, God's provision, his purpose, and the fact that he's personal. That this was a moment where the kings would dine in fellowship with God himself. And the lampstand was supposed to shine light on that and the light was never supposed to go out. And Christ says, the church is the lampstand. The thing that's supposed to shine light on a powerful God, one who provides, one who is purposeful, and one who for whatever reason desires to be personal. Yet what do we wanna do? We wanna take the lampstand and we wanna run around shining it on everything else. We wanna use it to expose and we wanna use it to endorse. Let's expose that political party. Let's endorse this political party. Let's chase around Hollywood. Let's go after these individuals. What's even more gross is we get in churches and on platforms and we say, and let's shine some light on me, which is a terrible miss. My goodness, don't ever get obsessed with man's leadership and overlook the Lordship of Jesus Christ. The purpose of the church is to shine light on a God who is powerful, on a God who is a provider, on a God who is purposeful, and a God who is personal. And that the purpose of the church is to allow individuals the opportunity to show up in a space and to see clearly, whoa, that's my king. That is my king. And I'm telling you, when it comes to the book of Revelation, the thing that is just so interesting to me is people are like, yes, I can't wait to talk about this. I wanna talk about the arrival of the Antichrist. And I think to myself, but what about the arrival of Christ? Oh, I wanna talk about the mark of the beast. But what about the mark of the lamb? I wanna talk about the end of the world. And I'm like, but what about the beginning of God's wonderful, beautiful, full creation? Church, we can't move the lampstand. He's King Jesus. And it's when we see him accurately, it, it just, it shakes us to our core. Ah, and I love it because John falls in fear after he sees Christ. And Jesus puts his hand on his shoulder and says, hey, fear not. And some of you, I get it. I'm living in the same world you're living in. Fear not. This God is outstanding and you can trust him. Amen.